Uh, so I'll ask you now to welcome Mike Treen, the National Director for Unite. Good morning, everybody. Um, good to see you all here and uh, looking forward to spending a couple of days with you. Um, when we founded uh, Unite, uh, or refounded it, in terms of doing an organising drive for many of the sectors that had been abandoned by the traditional union movement, and, uh, and we had a look at the sort of the, the situation facing workers around that time, around 13 years ago, we saw a landscape that was pretty bad. There, were no, there was almost no unions existing in the fast food sector, among call sector workers, among security guards, and many of, most of the hotels had been deunionized. And people were on contracts with no guaranteed hours, and the minimum wage was down to about a third of the average wage. It was a pretty bleak state of affairs for hundreds of thousands of working people. And we thought we would set ourselves the task of trying to at least turn that around. We didn't believe that young workers didn't want to or wouldn't be willing to join unions. We didn't believe that there wasn't a chance to change the attitude around minimum wages and lift those wages. We didn't believe that we didn't have the right to secure hours, guaranteed hours. We believed that if we took that message out there, that workers would join unions and the public would support us in our efforts. And we were proved correct. Your presence here is part of that proof. But what we achieved over the last 10 or 13 years is also proof of that. We organised unions in the fast food sector, we organised collective agreements, and we started to tackle the issue of insecure hours. It took us a while, but when we got there, we did get there eventually and finally in 2015 when we got rid of zero-hour contracts in the fast food industry and following that, throughout the country and then in law and we're able to use that new law in the negotiations this year to, to cement in those guaranteed hours to be a permanent feature of life and this is going to affect hundreds of thousands of workers in this country, not just the victory of the fast food workers because it's being spread throughout um, industry after industry that had turned or tried to turn working class people into simple casual units that they could at their beck and call. So long as it was profitable to them, they would deign to offer you a little bit of work. Um, but as soon as work dropped off a little bit, all the price of business was put on the worker. All the risks of business was put on the worker. You were the ones who had to suffer there problems, their creation, their system in terms of the ups and downs of business, the inequalities that exist in society. So these are steps towards reducing the inequality and the gross, gross growth in inequality that had occurred over many decades in this country. The other issues that we dealt with uh, we, went, we got rid of youth rates in the industries. That was the other key issue that we started on. And we also began to lift the minimum wage through campaigns for first a 12-hour minimum wage and then a $15 an hour minimum wage. And we did lift the minimum wage in real terms. It's still shit. We all know that it's shit. But we lifted that, I talked about, we lifted it from about a third of the average wage to around 53% of the average wage now. In real terms, we forced it up through those campaigns, including a petition I remember many of you may have helped and we collected over 200,000 signatures to lift it to $15 an hour at that time. What I'm proposing is that we make a campaign that we make a campaign and make, and it's a real possibility, I believe, is to make the minimum wage a living wage. To make that, so that no one, 
No one in this country should have to work for anything less than the living wage. The living wage at the moment is $20.20 an hour. That's the designated living wage. Winston Peters has said in his negotiations with the governments that he's going to be, one thing is only certain in this negotiation period, so Winston's going to be in the next government. That's the only thing that's certain. Um, but Winston has said he wants the minimum wage lifted to $20 an hour relatively quickly. The Labour Party has said they want to lift it to two-thirds of the average wage, which is about the same as the living wage, actually, this two-thirds figure. Um, um, and that's the official target of the Council of Trade Unions, and it's been our official target as well, that we want to lift the minimum wage to two-thirds of the average wage, which is the living wage. And the, and the Labor Party has said that they will do that if economic permission, conditions permit. Uh, they've got a caveat, they've got an escape clause, but, you know, they always had that. They had that with the $12 minimum wage too, back in the last time they were in government, when they promised that, they said, when, if economic conditions permitted. But we made sure, through our campaigns, to make that a reality. They had it in their promise, they had it said, this is our target, but we made the target a reality through our campaigning. We will need to do the same in any future government. So Winston says $20, so Labor Party has said it's got to, we've got to go to two-thirds of the average wage. The Green Party said a similar policy as well. So there's a very good chance, whatever happens, that we're going to be able to continue to lift the minimum wage in real terms, in real value, as a percentage of the average wage, and our target has got to be to make the minimum wage a living wage, and, we want, and, and if we can achieve that, it's going to have a big victory for working people across this country. It's going to help lift everybody up, because wages are built from the bottom up. This is not a, people, people shouldn't resent people at the bottom getting a step up, because everyone's wages is built, are built on, uh, they're all wages system is, are built from the bottom up. So everybody, if we can get the bottom up, then everybody's earning above that gets a chance to increase their uh, 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 incomes and living standards as well. I want to touch on a couple of other points. That's going to be our key campaign. I think that's going to be overriding everything we do at this conference. Uh, we've, we've established all our major contracts with steps on lifting wages uh, 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 in addition to the, any steps that are lifted in terms of the minimum wage movement. So we've banked on the minimum wage going up, but we did agreements with McDonald's, with the big fast food companies, that they had to increase by the minimum wage plus 10 cents every year. That's a small thing. We did a three-year agreement with McDonald's. It means the minimum wage, the starting rate at McDonald's is going to be 30 cents above the minimum wage in three years' time. That's a that's actually a big principle step forward because we were never able to get more for the starting rate in these industries. We were never able in the past to get more than the, than the minimum wage as the start rate. We, we, we fought for steps to be put into the contract so that you moved off the minimum wage as soon as possible, but never the start rate. So again, last year or this year, in the negotiations for the first time, we've got them committing to moving step by step at least 10 cents a year off the minimum wage for all the start rates, so they'll be 30 cents off. And that's on top of whatever movement we're able to get through these negotiations for the formation of a new government. Now, I want to touch on a couple of other things that is a little bit to do with the world and society in which we live. One of the things that we've been working on is also that uh, we, are, we, as a union, we are, we are completely connected into the climate justice movement in this country. And Gary has been heading up that work here, and it's very, very valuable work, and important work that we're part of. Because we don't have jobs, we don't have incomes, if we don't have a planet on which to live. And that is part of what we do as a union. We have to make sure that we have a society where we fight inequality, but also a society that respects the planet and the country in which we live and everything that we get is a product of our interaction with that, with that natural environment, with the world uh, that we are part of and we can't destroy that world. And we can't use the mechanisms of a system designed for continual and perpetual growth and enrichment of the 1% 
This system is designed to degrade the environment because they treat the world and the natural world and the planet as simply commodities, as simply uh, uh, sources of profit. So we need to start putting forward a new perspective, a new society in which we treat the planet and the people who produce the wealth in society as the number one concern and interact and we must live together and survive together. There's another part that I think is important today. It's not something we usually do as part of our introductions to our conference. That is, there is a very real danger that the leading politicians of the most powerful country in the world, the United States, will simply destroy this planet through his reckless and warmongering behaviour. This is not a... This is not, this, this is not a... Mm, this, yeah, this is not... This is not something that um, uh, anybody in the world today can allow this, ha this, this type of reckless, war-mongering, war-making uh, 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 political uh, pro uh, 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 forces to be not challenged. We need to be part of that challenge. Right? We need to say that, that this state has no right. This nuclear armed, multi-thousand dollar nuclear weapon armed state that has used them twice on people, used them twice on people in, in Japan, that is the only state that's ever used its nuclear weapons, that this government, this state has no right to be threatening the peoples of the world. It's got no right to threaten the people of Venezuela with invasion and overthrow when Venezuela is simply trying to build a country that's a little different and operating on a little different principles to that of the United States. It's got no right to threaten war against the people of Korea because it's not just the people of North Korea that war. If war was unleashed on the Korean peninsula, the entire peninsula will be reduced to ashes, as it was once a few decades ago. It was reduced to virtually ashes through, the, uh, through a, a, an invasion at that time. They have no right to be threatening, threatening to use its military force wherever and where, whenever it wants to, to, to impose its view of how the world should be run, because this is a dangerous and reactionary view of how the world should be, should be run. There's another side to what's developing around this, and that is these extreme right-wing movements that are growing all over the globe. These movements, and, and, and Trump is represented, they, they are racist movements, they are anti-immigrant movements, they are anti-working class movements, because when the right-wing, these extreme right-wing movements, when they take power, they destroy all democratic organisations, starting with the labour movement. They'll target somebody like the fascist target the Jews in the 1930s. They'll target immigrants today or a national minority or gyp gypsies or, or racial minorities or whatever it might be because they want us fighting among ourselves. They don't want us blaming the system. They want us turning on ourselves, fighting amongst ourselves so they can impose their, 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 their exploitative system upon us. But we need to be cognizant of this because it's an interactive thing. These are dangerous movements. Trump is giving them, giving them power and life and, and energy right across the globe. We've got to watch out for it here, but, but wherever it is, we've got to be ready to fight it. And we've got to, we've got to be part because we're part of an international movement. The working class movement, the union movement, is part of an international movement. That's why we, we actually don't win unless our workers are making progress all over the world. Actually, It makes it much easier for us to win. That's why we sent Joe to the UK. Joe helped organise the very first McDonald's strikes in this country. He helped organise the very first McDonald's strikes in the UK. If they make progress in the UK, it'll help us here next time, we're, uh, next time we're around the table with McDonald's. The more we can get union being built in this international company, because the enemy we're up against, is, these are giant multinational companies. This 1% that own and control these companies, they are powerful, they meet, they decide, they, they plot, they, 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 they want to take away our rights, take away our incomes, take away our living standards, take away our planet, but we, together, need to protect all of those things, Kira.